That was in relation to figure 5.3. So I'll see if I can uh, get it here. So this figure, and we were we were talking about the blowout preventer. Uh, the blowout preventer, which is down here. And then the question was, what is a bag preventer up here? So now I'm going to just show you a short clip that shows a bag preventer and what it does. Let me run it through full screen here. So this is from uh, GE, which I've created one. So you can see this is a sort of a rubber bag, basically. And when they set pressure to the green, they compress the entire bag and it will sort of press on the, uh, on the riser going up there. So it's sort of to, to avoid anything slipping past the, past the uh, tube, basically. So that's what the bag preventer is, just making a, a tight seal around there. So I also had um, another clip I found, which we can uh, yeah, take a look at, uh, which was in relation to, uh, to the process of drilling subsea. Because we were looking at these different kinds of ways of drilling from a semi-submersible vessel, from a uh, floating vessel, and from a jack-up dr uh, jack drilling unit. And here we can see a pretty good example of uh, how they do it from a ship. This isn't, uh, they aren't drilling an oil well in this case, but they're using the same equipment for drilling. But they are not lowering down the, the bases and uh, the, the Christmas trees and everything. What they're doing here, they're actually trying to drill as far down as they can get for research purposes. So they're trying actually to get all the way into the magma that's all the way below. So that's uh, what this project is. But they, they made a really cool, um, cool clip of it, actually. Let's skip this one. How does the deep sea drilling vessel Chiku drill into the sea floor? When the vessel arrives at the drilling site, it receives a satellite signal that helps the vessel move into the exact position required. The vessel has six propellers that rotate a full 360 degrees and keep the vessel in one position, preventing it from drifting due to the wind, waves, or sea current. First, the conductor pipe is installed. As the drill pipes are connected, the conductor pipe and guide are run down to the seafloor. After the conductor pipe penetrates the seafloor, the drill pipe is released and pulled back to the vessel. A large drill bit connected to the bottom of the drill pipe is run down to the seafloor. The drill bit is led down to the bottom of the hole through the conductor pipe. The drill bit rotates and drills the sediment and rock below the seabed. Seawater is sprayed from nozzles on the drill bit to range the cuttings to the sea floor. After drilling several hundred meters, the drill bit is pulled back to the vessel. A casing pipe about 50 centimeters in diameter is set into the drilled hole to keep it from collapsing. The casing pipe is run down through the conductor pipe and is inserted into the hole using the drill pipe. Cement is pumped into the space between the hole and the casing pipe to fix the pipe in place. After cementing, the drill pipe is released and pulled back to the vessel. 
That's the, the same as they do in equipped with the riser the, uh, system in well. order to drill into the earth even deeper. As the riser pipes are added one after another, the blowout preventer is run down to the seafloor. The blowout preventer is connected to a wellhead which is located on top of the casing pipe. The vessel is now connected to the seafloor via the riser pipe. A drill bit smaller than the one first used is run down through the riser pipe and casing pipe. The drilling begins. Once the riser pipe has been connected, drilling mud is used instead of seawater. When the target depth is reached, the drill bit is pulled back to the vessel. To drill the hole even deeper, a narrower casing pipe is set in to protect the drilled hole. After the casing pipe has been installed, cement is pumped into the space between the hole and the casing pipe to fix the pipe in place. Again, an even smaller drill bit is run down through the riser pipe and casing pipe and the drilling continues. Repeating this process, the Chiku will drill through the ocean crust to collect fresh, live mantle. This is something that has never been done before. That's pretty... They're going pretty deep compared to, to the subsea. Oh, that was even more. I've forgotten that. <laughs> Rotary drilling is used for ocean drilling. Let's look at the features of this method. First, the drill pipes are connected one after another as they run down to the seafloor. The work of connecting the drill pipes and drilling the hole are powered by a motor on the derrick. The drill pipe has a drill bit attached to the bottom. With rotary drilling, the drill pipe is rotated and the drill bit at the end crushes sediment and rock to make the hole. After a while, cuttings accumulate at the bottom and drilling cannot go any further. Seawater or other liquid is then pumped from the vessel down through the drill pipe and is jetted out of the nozzles on the drill bit. This liquid current forces the cuttings up to the seafloor. That is rotary drilling. As you can see, what they're actually doing is they're rotating the entire drill pipe in order to make the drill rotate. The deep sea drilling vessel Chiku can drill over seven kilometers below the seafloor into the earth. To drill even further below the seafloor, a riser system is used. With the riser system, mud is used instead of seawater. There are several reasons for using mud. First, it has greater viscosity than seawater to force cuttings up from the bottom of a deeper hole. Also, with the increase in pressure at greater depths, the formation pressure becomes much greater than the pressure in the hole filled with seawater. The hole will collapse if a certain differential pressure between the outside and the inside of the hole is reached. Mud has a higher density than water, therefore the pressure inside the hole remains higher, and the hole will not cave in, allowing deeper drilling. The drilling mud is artificially conditioned with various kinds of products, and it is expensive. Discharging it on the seafloor is bad both environmentally and economically. The mud is therefore collected and reused. For this purpose, the riser pipe is connected all the way from the vessel to the seafloor. The drilling mud sprayed out of the drill bit returns to the vessel through the riser pipe together with the cuttings and is collected and recycled at the vessel. 
Riser drilling not only makes it possible to drill deep into the earth, it is a breakthrough drilling method that is both environmentally and economically sound. Riser drilling will make it possible to drill all the way down into the earth's mantle, a depth never before reached in all of history. That gives you a, a bit more of an insight into how how the drilling works uh, with it. It's, it's uh, a lot better to actually see a good a good animation uh, of it uh, in order to get to know what happens. And as you can see, they, they also had to use a lot of the stuff that they use in subsea wells with the casings, the blowout preventer, and everything. But the, the only thing was that they stopped there. They wouldn't exchange the blowout preventer with a with an Exmos tree in order to get the oil up afterwards because I'm pretty sure that they weren't, uh, I'm pretty sure that they didn't hit any oil where they were going, but still there would be a lot of pressure down there, so you could still get, get a lot of, uh, 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 lot of this uh, mud that they were using to, to get, the, get the cuttings up. This could have ended up with getting a huge blowout uh, after a while, so it's good to have the blowout preventer in place in order to, to stop that. <coughs> And um, let's see if we can uh, can find my place here again. The instrument. We had looked at these cam rings last time, and I think we looked at this one also. If I can remember correctly. Uh, and we were going to to talk about it basically <coughs> uh, because we have uh, we have the the valve assembly inside this this is the this is a sort of a schematic of a uh, Christmas tree so we can see here up until let's see if I can uh, see the edges here uh, yeah, here it is. Here is the wellhead down here, so it's connected. You have the the connector up to the Christmas tree. Then you have the Christmas tree itself, and then you have the tree cap on top there. And inside the Christmas tree, we have all of the all of the valves that are being used. So, <coughs> uh, for our our valves, uh, we have the. Uh, the fail-safe valves uh, going up the production tubing here. So we have uh, a lower master valve, and we have an upper master valve in this case. And then as we go past those, uh, we have the swab valves and the wing valves. So the wing valves is where they actually take out the production, which is going up to the, uh, to the rig. So it's going through the wing valve. You have an ad adjustable choke in order to uh, to sort of limit the uh, limit the flow if needed and it goes through this pipe and up to the rig then you also have a lot of other uh, valves in there you have the annulus pressure which is going up this this other uh, pipe here where you also have master valves you have wing valves and you have swab valves and those are because you need to to equalize the pressure inside the annulus <coughs> And the annulus would be uh, the area where they showed in the movie, uh, where they had brown mud going up. That would be the annulus. And they were pumping down through their uh, drill riser. They were pumping the recycled mud down, and then it was going up on the outside, still inside the riser and everything, but on the outside of the, of the uh, drilling pipe. Uh, so you sort of get two two areas of pressure there. You have a pressure inside the uh, drilling pipe, and then you have a pressure in the annulus, and then you have the pressure of the surroundings outside there again. So there are two barriers. <coughs> uh, 
So for the valve block, we have a lot of main functions for it. It's supposed to direct the produced fluid from the well and into the flow line. <coughs> and basically, that's just directing it. But you can go the other way also, because this is the produced fluid is coming from the oil reservoir, going into the flow line, which goes to, to wherever it's being processed. If it's up top side on a, on a rig, or if it's to some subsea processing plant, or if it's in pipelines all the way into uh, to shore and uh, being processed on land. Uh, th that is one way of looking at it, but you can also do it the opposite way, where if you are uh, using an extra well, where you are pumping down seawater or something else to increase the pressure, or uh, not increase, but keep the pressure up inside the, inside the oil reservoir, it would go the other way. So then uh, you would have the, through the flow line, you would get whatever it is you are pumping down, and then you would direct it down into the reservoir instead. <coughs> also, in the uh, the uh, valve block, you are to uh, to uh, be able to safely stop the flow, so that if you're if something uh, say you're up a, a top side on a rig, there is something wrong with some of the equipment, you may have to exchange some parts of the of the process equipment. Then it would be nice to just be able to safely stop the flow from the reservoir. So you don't have to uh, sort of cut everything and uh, start over again. So that's where you have the choke valves and everything come into place and then the production master valves where you can sort of lock off everything, keep it inside the well, and then you can do your maintenance work uh, on the system. You also have smaller, uh, smaller uh, valves where you can inject corrosion and hydrate inhibitors. Hydrate is basically the fact that you can get formations of ice uh, inside, the, inside the pipes. It's a, especially a problem in many uh, gas fields where they are producing gas. You get uh, water hydrates inside the pipeline, inside the flow line on its way from the well and to the, uh, to the uh, uh, processing plant. Uh, Usually it is because uh, down in the reservoir, you have a very high pressure and you have a lot of heat. It's pretty warm down there. And then when they uh, come up of out of the well and into the flow line, the flow line is going through uh, seawater, which is just a couple of degrees Celsius. So it's sort of being really, it's still at the same pressure more or less, but it's being rapidly cooled by the surroundings. And then you can have hydration form. So then the basically it will be uh, you can uh, end up having ice crystals forming inside the flow. And that's, that's not good for the, for the uh, uh, process. So then you put in mm, inject hydrate inhibitors, which uh, make sure that you don't get any hydration. And also you have the corrosion uh, inhibitors you can put in. Basically, if you are producing a little bit of sand also, so that there are along with the oil and gas, you are getting just small amounts of sand coming up through the well. Every time you have a bend in your uh, flow line, whether it is a sharp bend or if it's just a slow one, uh, you will end up with that sand sort of scraping along the inner edges of the pipe. And that will uh, mainly cause erosion, but it can also cause uh, corrosion over time. So if this is just a little bit so that the erosion isn't really a huge problem, it won't, it won't sort of uh, uh, grind away all of the metal of the pipeline, you will after a while end up with having uh, damaged the inside of the pipeline, and this will be more prone to corrosion often. So that's uh, also a nice, nice thing to do. And, and also you can end up getting other things than sand also in, in the well stream that will end up being bad for, uh, for corrosion. That is something we will look more into in the last part of the compendium, uh, more on the corrosion part, how things corrode. Mostly we will look at uh, reasons why they corrode outside the in, in the seawater, uh, but also we will look a bit at, at the components of the well flow and what they can cause. It is also possible through the uh, uh, valve block to 
sort of kill the well. So you basically inject a lot of fluid into it. Uh, I'm not completely up top on how they do it now, but I know that in the past they, they sort of fill the top of the well with a heavy fluid and uh, they sort of managed to stop the uh, the well flow basically and, and and they call it killing the well because it they have to do a lot of work in order to get the the well up and running again so this is sort of a this is sort of a uh, uh, second to last uh, emergency measure the last emergency measure is of course to to completely sever the connection use the sort of like a in the blowout preventer where you can completely just cut it uh, as a possibility uh, but this one is a bit more easy to to fix afterwards so st it still uh, requires a lot of work but you still have to you can you can still use the same equipment afterwards so that it's uh, you don't have to exchange everything down there <coughs> and uh, of course we talked about the choke so regulating or choking the uh, flow of the fluid from the well is one of the one of the tasks of the valve block and the bleed off the excessive annulus pres uh, pressure as we talked about in the annulus where you can have this extra pressure coming up there if if that pressure rises uh, uh, considerably as they were talking about with the reason why they switched from seawater to mud as they got deeper was because that the pressure from the the, the rock was basically high enough that they could collapse the uh, the drilled hole. And the same can happen inside uh, the riser. So in, uh, you have inside the annulus, and then you have the production string going down. And if you get too high of a pressure in the annulus, you can sort of start collapsing uh, stuff in, in the uh, uh, production tubing. So that uh, it's uh, very important to sort of keep keep those two pressures in an equilibrium basically to keep them keep them the same more or less so if if the annulus pressure starts to rise then you uh, bleed it off uh, basically i think i'm not quite sure if they still bleed it off directly to seawater but i know that's what they did uh, many years ago so they, they they just open it up and let let the excess pressure go straight out but of course in the annulus you do have hydrocarbons and stuff so it's not that good for the environment but if it's that or uh, having the well collapsing, it's uh, I guess they they uh, sort of justified it that way. Also, we get uh, managed to get an access to the annulus tubing casing through the uh, main valve block in here, and also you can have a lot of sensors inside uh, monitoring equipment to to monitor temperature, pressure and uh, stuff like that from the, uh, maybe you even have a, I'm not quite sure if they used, uh, usually place flow meters down there to, to check the, the rate of flow, but uh, temperature and pressure is uh, definitely something that they monitor. And through the uh, valve block, it's going to be a tight seal, of course, or else we'll have leakages. And also it has to be rigid because you have these movements coming from the, from the risers everything uh, especially if you're going straight up to to a production uh, uh, plant or rig or, or a floating vessel then you will have movements and stuff but but still even if you are uh, sending it down to the seafloor uh, along the seafloor in a flow line you can will still have movements from ocean currents and everything so that it's very important that it's rigid and strong And easily to connect the tree running tool, which is uh, the tool they basically use to, to lower down the tree, the, the Christmas tree, and do uh, the connections and everything. And facilitate all the aspects of maintenance outside the tree. So, so here you have, have all of the, uh, the uh, manual uh, valves that you can uh, switch, that the ROV or the diver can come down there and actually switch all of the uh, valves manually, instead of uh, basically if, if your uh, remote control from, from your production plant is uh, for some reason not functioning as it should, then everything can be done directly outside the tree. 
so you have direct manual access there. And then we have uh, a few important design factors. We have to prevent hydrates, of course. Uh, as I said earlier about injecting the, the hydrate inhibitors. So one of the main functions is to be able to prevent this from, uh, from um, being formed. We, we need to take uh, temperature into consideration if we are designing a Christmas tree. We need to know what the temperature uh, is going to be. Uh, both the temperature of the water, which is fairly stable, and the temperature coming from, uh, from the uh, produced fluid. We need to know the pressure, of course. Um, if, if, if you design it with, uh, with, uh, for too low of a pressure, then you risk it uh, breaking apart or at least having a leak somewhere in uh, some of the seals. You need to take into consideration how much hydrogen sulfide and carbon dioxide uh, and of course the sand for erosion that's going to come up through the flow. And now we have the... Yeah, there we go. There we go. <coughs> so here we have an oriented type uh, of tree on this side. This is an oriented Christmas tree. It is a bit better to, to look at the figure in your book, but uh, it is still not, not all that readable. You need to have good eyes to be able to read the text. But here we have the annulus swab valve up top here. This is the annulus swab valve, the annulus wing valve, the annulus master valve going through the tree here. Here is the wellhead down here. And here we have the production lower master, upper master valve for production, the production wing valve going out here for the flow line. And then we have the, the swab valve up here. <coughs> and as you can see, these, these two are a bit different because this one is an oriented uh, Christmas tree, while this one is a concentric Christmas tree. And the concentric one means that basically the production line is going through the entire middle of the tree. So the annular stuff is just, just way out on the side here. And uh, you have the production going through the center and then out for a flow line, out on the side. <coughs> so uh, the, the reason the difference between this is, of course, that the oriented one, it has to be oriented in a, an exact angle. So, so it's, when it's coming down, it can't just be placed exactly as you're putting it. It has to be oriented to a specific angle for it to, uh, to stay in. While the concentric one, it's not that important what angle it has because everything is in the center. So it's a bit easier to, to put it into place. Of course, for... for for the oriented one, uh, the production pipe here that is going up is is not in the center, which means that you have to rotate it until you will hit the get the production pipe in the correct position that you needed it in. So that's why you need to orient it that way. Uh, there are other ways also of uh, of designing them. <coughs> this is what's called a monoblock tree. And here you can see it's uh, more of a, a uh, bit different design with the annulus coming up like it does in the oriented one. You can see this one also needs orientation because the production, the production uh, tubing is not in the center in this one either. You also have the split trees where you have uh, the tree is actually split into two. So you have a lower part the Christmas tree and you have an um, upper part of the Christmas tree. So you have some of the valves are in the lower part and some of the valves uh, are in the upper part of it. <coughs> There's a lot of, lot of different designs for the Christmas trees and mostly it depends a lot on what kind of fluid are you getting from the well, 
uh, what types of systems do you have, what types of contractors does, your, uh, does the oil company use. Some contractors might only have a couple of types of uh, Christmas trees designs that they use. Other contractors might choose from the whole range. So it's, uh, it's pretty, uh, uh, at least the impression I've gotten is that it's, it's pretty, what's it called? Um, it's, it's pretty uh, incidental what, what kind of Christmas tree is, is chosen for a specific spot. It's not always very, uh, very clear which type of uh, Christmas tree design is going to be used on every spot, so they just choose one, basically. <coughs> Here we have a modular concept. So they've actually split it. It's like the, the, the last one here, where we had the, the split, where you have one part and then a second part on top of that. It's basically the same that they've done here, only instead of placing them on top of each other, they've placed them uh, alongside of each other. <coughs> so, um, what's the next one? Just have to see if uh, we were doing the. No, let's do this one first. I thought I had switched around uh, some on, on the um, sequence, uh, but I was following. I, I seem to be following the sequence of the compendium. I was just thinking about switching it. <coughs> so for the uh, for the Christmas Christmas tree, we have the wellhead here. It's connected, the connector here, and then we have the lower master valve. We can see here. Here are the hangers with the casings going down. No, no, the, the hangers with the tubing, I mean, the casings are, of course, further down. Uh, here is the annulus valve access. Uh, you can see the size of the Christmas tree here. So it's 7 and 1 16th of an inch of this particular Christmas tree. <coughs> and... Now we have the horizontal uh, Christmas tree that we're looking at, which is what they are using more and more and more. And I think, actually, it's at least in, in the Norwegian uh, systems, they are mostly using the horizontal ones. And what, what the horizontal ones do is that they've, they've sort of moved the valves off to the side, so they are not directly on top of the well anymore. But this means that they can uh, uh, they can uh, come in through the top here and do these so-called wireline services. So they can lower on a wire from a ship. They can lower uh, equipment down, and they can enter it through the top of the Christmas tree and have it pass through here because there are no valves blocking their way or anything. There are no valves constricting a space or anything like that. They have a pretty good space going through here. So they can uh, lower them down and do all of the work that they need to be doing. So that's uh, that's one of the main reasons why they are choosing the horizontal trees instead. And basically, th they are called horizontal because they are now moving, uh, placing the valves horizontally uh, compared to the well, which is going vertically. So all of the previous ones that we looked at, the valves were more or less vertically on top of the on top of the uh, uh, drilled hole. And as you can see here, they have also put in uh, ROV, manual override. So here you have possibilities of manually overriding valves. And also you have electrical control units and bat uh, backup battery power for it, so, so that you can control everything remotely, electrically. But you can also come down with an ROV and you can do it manually, if need be. That's um, almost a, a separate field uh, b because doing wireline services, th those are highly specialized companies that do it. 
uh, but I know that uh, they can come down here and fix stuff with the tubing hangers, uh, the the uh, uh, the sub surface controlled subsurface safety valve, the SCSSV. They can uh, replace those with the uh, with the wire line improvement and stuff. So there's a lot of things where you you won't get access from by an ROV up here. So or, or everything that's further down into the hole, they can uh, fix and replace if there is something that needs to be done. Uh, I also uh, am pretty sure that when they are doing what's called fracking, uh, I'm not sure if you've heard about that, uh, they were doing a lot of fracking in uh, America with this uh, sand oil that they are getting. So, so basically what they do is they, they drill, drill a well, they put some equipment down into the hole, and then they start pumping a pressure into uh, into the ground. So what they're doing is they are, they are uh, pumping, a, a, I think it's a specific kind of fluid that they're pumping in there and it makes the ground crack. So that, that's uh, sort of one of the reasons why they're calling it fracking. So they are basically cracking open the reservoir in order to make it flow better. So that's something that can be done uh, through wireline services. You go through the top here you lower down the equipment, you lock it into place in the correct, in correct place where you intend to, uh, to start fracking and uh, creating better flow in the, uh, in the reservoir, which is a good way of getting more oil out of the reservoir, of course, beca because you make it flow better so that if you have already gotten all of the easy oil out of the reservoir, then you can so crack it open and make it flow, uh, make the rest of the oil flow a bit better so, so that you get, get more out of there. But what's actually happened in, in uh, America where they've done it, in the United States, not quite. I think they've done some of it in Canada also, but but they've also actually uh, noticed that they get uh, small earthquakes. That they actually trigger small earthquakes when they are doing this. So it's a uh, it's a pretty pretty invasive uh, operation to be doing. Just thinking about uh, doing this in in the middle of America, where they have this oil and starting to creating earthquakes in the middle of America. That's uh, that's not good. So they've had a lot of, uh, but, but there's a lot of research here, so I'm not, uh, I'm not, I don't think they've definitely proved that it is this fracking that has caused these small uh, earthquakes. But uh, they are, I know that uh, a lot of the research that's been done feels pretty sure that the fracking is the reason, but um, they have no definite proofs yet, as far as I know. But still, it's, uh, it's uh, food for thought, uh, thinking about what we do uh, everywhere. It's, it can actually have uh, pretty, pretty uh, dire consequences. And especially in, in, uh, in like America, we talked about the, the uh, West Coast, where they have a lot of earthquakes. This, of course, is more inland, so it's, it's past this mountain range. It's more in, inside the interior of the United States, but still suddenly starting to get smaller earthquakes in there where you are used to not really having much earthquakes, then it uh, can, be, can be a bit uh, frightening, uh, I can imagine, for, for the people living there. So they don't want, want, to, want to experience the big ones. <coughs> so for the next one, this is a uh, Christmas tree used on the surface. So, so if you're in a, uh, in, in like there in America where they are uh, pumping oil or getting oil off from uh, on land, that's more or less how a, a Christmas tree would look like. They of course don't really look like that when we are subsea because you have all of this yellow uh, uh, steel around it. You have all of the orange handles where the ROVs are supposed to, to uh, grab hold of. So it doesn't really look like this, but the, the principle is still the same. <coughs> you have the, the production string coming up from the well down low, and you have the, uh, the wellhead down in here. You can see the, the yellow top of the, the wellhead. No, the, the yellow is the production string, and the, the green here is the wellhead. Then you have the first master valve coming up here. So this one is, uh, you can use this to block off the entire flow if you want to. Then you have the upper master valve. Uh, usually they have two of these, but they only use one. 
because uh, sooner or later, every time they have to stop the flow using a master valve, it gets uh, gets some wear and tear, and after a while, it won't it won't really work as it's supposed to work. So that's why they put in two because then they have this backup valve which they can use if the first one uh, stops working. And I, I think it's usually that they uh, they use the upper valve first because if uh, or when the upper valve stops working and they switch to using the lower valve, they can, the next time they are down doing some large maintenance, they can switch the upper valve while the lower valve is locked so that they can do, do maintenance on it. <coughs> uh, one of the ways that they uh, decrease the wear and tear of these master valves is that they often use the choke valve instead. So they choke down the uh, flow so that they get uh, less and less flow until it's uh, almost completely uh, closed, and then they close, close the master valves. So that's one of the ways they, uh, they try to avoid wear and tear on them. Uh, and other than that, uh, the, uh, the choke valve is used, used to, to um, just regulate the flow uh, into the production. <coughs> There's the kill wing connection where they will hook up equipment in order to pump in the kill fluid if they need to, to, uh, to kill the valve. So that they uh, or kill the well. They have a valve here and they will have to connect something in order to, to uh, pump this fluid in. You have the swab valve up top which is more for, uh, for um, allowing access for equipment in inside the, uh, the production tree. And then you have the production wing valve which is al also possible to, to stop the flow there. And at top you have the tree cap. And all the way on top on this one, you have a small gauge to, to show you the pressure inside. That will, of course, be, be, uh, be replaced with just the pressure sensor on the subsea wells, and then the pressure sensor will send the signal up to, to the control panel. <coughs> but I think it's a, uh, it's a bit, bit easier to see all of the valves when you, you get this uh, surface Christmas tree to, to look at. So the, the master valves, you usually have, usually have two, but some Christmas trees only have one. And you both have them for, for, for the production string, and you also have them for the, for the annulus, at least in the, in the uh, uh, subsea wells. I'm not quite sure how much they, uh, how much, uh, they use annulus valves on, on surface Christmas trees, but... That's not a part of our curriculum, so <laughs> we'll just run past it. The wing valves for both production and annulus uh, is used in order to, to direct the, the flow out to the side. And then the swab valve in order to get access from the top. And then the injection valve if you need to inject uh, inhibitors for hydrate and corrosion. And then the choke valve for uh, controlling the production flow. Yeah, that was uh, everything there. And now we're going to look a bit more at uh, the design of choke valves. That's a bit... Um, let's see. Yeah, this was the place where I start jumping a bit back and forth between stuff here. Um, <coughs> Right, so we'll uh, first look a bit at the choke valve, different designs for it. Uh, 
this is uh, figure 514, as you can see. <coughs> oh, we'll do a, do a break, of course. I'm completely caught up in this here. So 50-minute break. We'll be back at uh, 10 to a half there, so 20 minutes past.
Right, we'll uh, start. Oh, no, there's still one minute left. We'll wait for one minute before we start. Give them a chance to get inside. Right. Um, I was asked if I could just go through the uh, the uh, standard vertical Christmas tree, which is basically the same as the, as the green one for uh, for on land, which we looked at. Just go through it one more time and just show where everything goes. But before that, I just have uh, one message. Um, next week, there might be a move on this lecture. I'm going to try to move it to the Wednesday so that you just get two lectures with me uh, on the morning of the Wednesday. Uh, if I can't move it to the Wednesday, I'm going to have to move it to, to the Monday. Uh, so, that, But then you will have three lectures, two with Torbjörn and then one with me. So I'm going to do my very best to get it on the on the Wednesday so, so that you won't have, uh, have a very long Monday uh, there. Uh, that's basically because... On my own studies now, I have to do a certain amount of hours at a vocational studies school. Uh, and uh, I w went and talked to them yesterday, and basically they have their workshop hours on Tuesdays. And I have to be there through uh, quite a lot of their workshop hours. And they only have six-hour days, so that if I, I have uh, a lecture here and then I need to get over there, then I only get half a day in the workshop with them. So. That's every now and then I'm probably going to move the uh, the uh, Tuesday uh, lecture a little bit just to just to get to do the hours that I need to do there uh, for my own uh, own studies. Uh, hopefully, I will uh, be able to give you more than one week's notice uh, for it, uh, at least two weeks' notice when I intend to move it. Uh, this time it will be just one week because I wasn't aware that I could begin as quickly as I could. <laughs> I was basically there for a me just a meeting yesterday, and I ended up having one hour of, uh, uh, with their students already. So <laughs> that was sort of, uh, I hit the ground running, uh, basically. And they, uh, uh, they were al almost in insisted I and that I was to come today, but I didn't have time to move this lecture. Uh, I couldn't move it uh, on that short a notice. So I said, oh, from next week, and next week I'll try to come on the Tuesday. So there will be a bit back and forth on the Tuesdays there, but uh, I will uh, try to give you as much information as I can in the lectures and also write it on front of so that you will, will be able to, to, uh, to keep up with me there <laughs> if the uh, time edit uh, changes. Yes, we'll look at the vertical Christmas tree, which was the uh, standard basis. And as we saw, there were, there were a lot of ways of doing a vertical Christmas tree. You could have the concentric one, you could have the uh, two-part one, the split one, and many ways of doing it. But this is just a standard vertical one, where you have everything built into one Christmas tree, just like the one we were looking at for surface, the green one. But of course, you have a bit more valves showing on this one. So what happens is that we have, through this, which is the production tubing, this is where the oil comes, oil or gas. And it comes to the uh, lower uh, master valve for the production strength. This one is usually open so that it just passes straight through the master valve. Gets the upper master valve, which is also usually open. So it passes straight through that one also. And then it comes, it continues straight up and it hits the swab valve, which is usually closed. But since it hits the swab valve and that one is closed, the, uh, the wing valve is open so the oil can exit this way 
goes through the adjustable choke, which just uh, changes, alters the flow rate uh, of it, so sort of slows it down a bit. And then it goes through the production tubing and then off to the, the uh, rig or floating vessel or anything. More or less the same happens with the annulus pressure. It is uh, allowed to pass through a tube here up to the master valve for the annulus. Continues past that one because that one is usually not closed. There is also a wing valve there and then up to a swab valve which is closed. And then we also have the uh, pressure devices for measuring the annulus pressure and stuff. And then you have the uh, wing valve which can open it up to bleed it up. Looks like they are sending it into something else here when they are bleeding it off so that they are not just ejecting it to sea. <coughs> um, yeah. So the point with the swab valves up top here is that along this flow line, so if I'm going to um, just imagine that this flow line continues for a bit here. So we have it going on along the uh, seafloor here. And then at a point here, there is going to be a Y connection. And this Y connection will go up here. See if we can get it back up here. So we have this one that continues on straight in there. That's where the oil usually flows. But you have this one which goes up and it goes into a large loop and then it comes down on the top. And that is if you have these through flow line equipment. So that when you, if you're going to, if you're going to fix something down, uh, down into, the, uh, into the well, for an example, fix the, in the, uh, the uh, surface controlled subsurface safety valve, that awful name. Uh, so if you're going to fix then that one, you have to sort of shut off the wing valve, open the swab valve, and then you will pump down your equipment. It will go, there will be something that makes it do this Y loop instead of continuing straight forward. So it will move up here, do the loop, and then it will enter from the top and through the swab valve. Then it can continue all the way down to do the work it's supposed to do. <coughs> so that's the point with the, 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 the swab valve, is, is just to allow access for maintenance work inside the, the Christmas tree. And of course, when you get to the, uh, the horizontal trees, that's a lot of these, I see. when you get to the horizontal trees, you don't need this loop flow line and a swab valve up top because you have everything out on the side because it's a horizontal tree. So then you can get, get all the way down here with the wireline equipment instead. So you have, have better access that way, which is often why they are switching to the horizontal trees in order to allow easier access. So we were going to talk about choke valves. And there's a lot of ways uh, that they can, uh, uh, can design these. One of the ways is to using rotating discs, which means that inside the tube, you have two, uh, two rotating discs, one on top of the other. And both of them have these uh, holes in them. So whether they are just two holes or if there are more holes or just one hole, uh, but they will, none of the holes will be placed in the center. They will all be off-center. So that when you rotate these, uh, these uh, discs, you, will, uh, you can choose how much overlap these holes will have. So if you, if you open the choke valve to the maximum, then the holes on the lower disc will be perfectly aligned with the holes on the upper disc so that you will have the entire hole for the oil to flow through. But if you start rotating them then, like on this picture, where the lower disc has been rotated a bit, so you actually you just have this small area where there is flow going through it. <coughs> and then you can sort of start restricting everything. So it's a very, 
very nice way of doing it because you will have a lot of pressure hitting this disc, so it will have to withstand a lot of pressure, but all you need to do is just rotate it, and that's a lot easier than trying to close a flap or something. So uh, it's a very nice nice way of doing it without having to use too much energy in order to move the parts that needs moving in order to choke. Another way of doing it is to use the needle and seat uh, version where the oil will come flowing in uh, from the top here and it will flow along the needle and into the flow line. So then if you move the needle downwards you will just slowly close off the space between the needle and the edge there. So uh, if you move the needle all the way down so that it's placed uh, completely into contact there, then no nothing will be able to flow through. So that is also one that uh, allows for, for uh, not much energy usage, uh, simply because the oil is flowing past the needle. It's not sort of hitting the needle and uh, pushing against it. We also have a, a plug and cage version where you will have the flow coming from the sides down through holes in the insides here. But you can do this plug in the middle. You can lower this one down and then you can plug these holes, side holes, completely if you want to. And just little by little restrict the flow and then uh, in the end it will stop it completely. Uh, then you also have a sliding sleeve and seat, as it's called. Uh, almost the same principle as this one. You have this plug thing, which is moving up and down. But uh, in this case, you are moving. Uh, you have the side holes in the plug itself instead of having the side holes in the in the cage part. So you sort of just reverse the roles of the plug and the and the cage. Uh, and then you have the multi-stage cascade version where you have several areas where you can block it off. Uh, so when you move this one up and down, you will just restrict it in several places. So if you put this one in the uh, correct position, then it will block off all of the, all of the uh, cascades down here, as you can call it. So <coughs> it's also a, a good one to use, but uh, I, I think... To my knowledge, it's the rotating disc and the needle and seat that are the most commonly used ones. Uh, but, but these others are also used. <coughs> uh, yeah. The next one is... Yeah, we're just looking at one with a, a choke needle. So it has the, it has the seat down here and then a choke needle up here, which can be pushed all the way down into the seat. You will have the well flow from, from the wing well will be coming out here. And then it will flow past, uh, past the needle and then down into the production uh, line or flow line. And of course you see here, you have a lot of hydraulics up here in order to be able to, to regulate this choke needle uh, through hydraulics. But you also have the manual override. Uh, in this case, uh, it seems to be a manual override for a diver. Possibly this is a handle for an ROV to be able to turn it, but usually for the ROVs, they have a different type of handle uh, for them. <coughs> so if we need to close the Christmas tree, uh, let's see, just need to find my place here. So this is back on page 12, if you're uh, looking for it in, uh, in the uh, compendium. I wasn't quite, I didn't quite like the way uh, the sequencing that uh, the compendium used here, so I chose to jump a bit back and forth between the different stuff here, uh, just to get it in a more, more uh, 
natural sequence. So almost at the middle of the page there, we have the following conditions will be imposed to close the Christmas tree. So what we're looking at is functional and pressure tests are performed. And uh, if they are, especially the functional test, if, if there's something wrong with a functional test, then there's one of the valves that aren't working properly or some of the equipment isn't working properly. That will be reason for closing the Christmas tree and just uh, doing maintenance and getting this fun these functions to work. But also, if you, if you have pressures that are abnormal, so, so you are outside the regular pressure range, it might be useful to just close off the Christmas tree and try to figure out, well, why do we have this different pressure now? Has something happened in the well, or, or is, uh, is there some other reasons for this? A platform shutdown, of course, you need to close down the, the Christmas tree if the uh, producing uh, or, or the processing plant, rather, is, uh, needs to shut down for maintenance or something. Then you will also close down the Christmas tree so that you won't have any accidents uh, happen while you are doing, uh, doing the maintenance work on the platform. If there is a leak or deterioration uh, in the flow, so uh, then you also have to close down the Christmas tree because you have to figure out where is the leak uh, and then you have to do maintenance to, to fix that leak. Usually it will be a seal of some sort that is, uh, is leaking and uh, actually figuring out a leak like that can be quite difficult. Figuring out a leak at all uh, down when you're down at a couple of hundred meters or maybe even up to a thousand meters it's uh, pretty difficult. You don't you don't have much light. Daylight only reaches about 100 meters uh, into the sea. So uh, as soon as you get further below that, you need to have artificial light. And of course, you don't have any people down there. You don't uh, you don't have the ability of sort of smelling a gas leak or something. Uh, you can't do any of that. Also, if you have a gas or an oil leak, it, it's not like it's uh, the, the the oil from a leak like that won't actually be like uh, like the engine oil of your car, the black and uh, and stuff, because the blackness of the of uh, engine car oil and coarse oil is usually just uh, uh, just particles from from the engine, so it, it has been dirtied by the engine. Because usually it looks more like honey, so it's more of this golden color of it. And especially if you get it mixed into seawater directly, then it's go you, you basically can't see it if it's directly mixed into seawater. It's only when it sort of gathers up at the surface, that's when you really see that there is a leak going, when you start getting these sort of flakes of oil floating on the surface. So that's often how a leak is, is uh, uh, noticed. Basically, just the, the uh, people that are working on the platform notice that, wait, we, we have oil out in the sea here. Something has to be leaking somewhere. So then they will start looking for the leak. But there is a lot of work going on, especially like uh, in the Omen Lange field outside of uh, Norway, where they have everything subsea and then they send it back to shore. There, there isn't any ship or platform there that can keep an eye on, on the surface of the water and see if there is anything. So now they are working with, with the solutions with different types of cameras to try to, try to program digital cameras to, to sort of notice uh, this B because the digital cameras can of course they have infrared cameras and, and all sorts of things that they can see that our eyes can't see so it's a bit easier for a camera to detect a leak uh, when you are uh, in water so they are working with a lot of different solutions there of having just permanently placed cameras just viewing at all angles and just trying to pick up these and hopefully in such a way that the the camera uh, this, the camera system will be totally automated, so that it will actually know the computer will know as soon as there is a leak, even though a human eye can't see it on on the screen, even though we check the screen and we see uh, we can't see any leak there. The computer will tell us well there is a leak there, because the computer sees it. So that's a, a nice nice thing that they are working a lot on uh, to get to work properly. Uh, yeah, if, if the well flow is to be stopped for, for a longer period, uh, so if for some reason they can't produce, uh, uh, maybe 
uh, it's a fairly unlikely situation, but maybe the, uh, the tank ship that was coming, if, if it's a floating, an FPSO, floating production storage and offloading unit, so that stores everything it produces until a tanker comes along and it can offload it onto the tanker. So if this tanker is late, so the tanker can, uh, can't get there in time, uh, maybe it's had a breakdown uh, of an engine or anything, um, then the storage will be filled up to the brim. They can't produce anymore because they don't have anywhere to store it. Then they will have to stop the well flow for a while. And if they really have to wait uh, a long while for this, uh, for this tanker to arrive, then they would have to close down the Christmas tree because they, they don't want to do, do a well flow stop for, for a while without closing down the Christmas tree. <coughs> and of course, uh, for a workover, if they are going to change anything, uh, maintenance to do stuff uh, down uh, by the seafloor, doesn't necessarily have to be directly on the Christmas tree that they are going to do this maintenance, but just if they are close by uh, and stuff, because uh, an ROV, especially a work ROV, uh, often weighs several tons in air. When you have it on land or on top of the ship, it weighs several tons. But it has buoyancy elements, which makes it more or less neutral in water so that it will float by itself. But uh, the problem is that the mass is still the amount of tons. So if this ROV is moving at uh, a certain speed, it will still have the mass, so it will still do collision damage because the mass will still act as a punch, basically. So we'll get a lot of force if it crashes into something. So if you have, if you have work being done close to the Christmas tree, it is uh, often shut down in order, just in case that something happens, that you accidentally hit the Christmas tree or anything. You don't want to, to break anything and then have a huge leak. So then just stop the well flow just to make sure that if something is broken, then at least there won't be a, won't be a massive leak there. <coughs> so now I need to switch over for this one. Yeah. I have the <coughs> This is the uh, a flow diagram for a five well slot production template. So this is both figure 512 and 513. Figure 513 isn't shown here right now because that's just the legend for, uh, for what, are, what is everything here. So I'm going to gradually show it here. So we have first off at the top we have the annulus isolation valve which we have AIV and we see this one in here. So the annulus isolation valve. And the thing is that we have, uh, what they've shown here is two of four Christmas trees are shown. That's what they've written here. So this is one Christmas tree and this is one Christmas tree. Uh, and they've all only shown the valves on the top Christmas tree. They haven't shown the valves on, on the low one. So the annulus isolation valve is placed over here at the side. And you can see it, it is sent during this uh, dot, uh, slash line down here to the annulus bleed uh, line, which I'm guessing is a separate flow line. Then you have the annulus master valve. It is placed over here. So it's uh, the annulus master valve is if they need to close down uh, the annulus completely. You have the annulus swab valve, which is, of course, at the top. It's the swab valve, so it allows access if you're going to do, do work inside the, uh, inside the well. The choke valve is in this schematic placed all the way over here. But as you can see, if we follow this line down here, we will get all the way up here, which is uh, PWV, which is the production wing valve. We will get to that one a bit later. So it is in, it is in direct connection with the production line fr from the valve from the Christmas tree. Here we have a flow line isolation valve, 
on this one. And this one goes to the a pigging module. You remember we talked about pigs uh, last week, uh, which is basically just equipment that they can send through the flow lines in order to clean them and stuff because you get you get a lot of uh, a lot of buildup of grease and stuff on the inside of the flow lines, so you need to clean them. And some of them also have equipment like uh, not exactly X-rays but uh, ultrasound and stuff, so they can check. Uh, check the integrity of the pipe as they send it along. It is really a, a, a an excellent way of determining the health of a pipeline. But the problem is, uh, I was at a seminar once, and uh, the guy there he talked something about like, like between Great Britain and Norway, of all of the pipelines that are in there, it's like maximum 5% of them that you can send a pig through. So even though, even though it is the optimum way of uh, determining the health of the pipeline and figuring out if you need to replace a section of pipeline or anything if, if, if it's uh, being about to be broken, I it is uh, not something that you can use on most pipelines. And that is uh, mostly because there, are, uh, there will always be different, uh, there will always be uh, uh, bends and uh, you will have sort of valleys in the seafloor and stuff, so you will constantly get these wave patterns uh, in, in the in the production tubing and usually these the curves that they get on at least one of the curves along the length of the pipeline is uh, too sharp for the pig to pass through which means that most of the pipeline the pig could have gotten through but that certain point it can pass through so then it can't do this entire line of pipeline so it's a it's a pretty pretty uh, silly way of designing them, but <laughs> it's, it's just the way, the way it is. So instead they have to do the surveys from the outside, so they have to run ROVs, on, uh, fly ROVs over the, the, the pipelines and check them that way. So we, which is a fair enough way of doing it. Also, you, you, you they usually uh, figure out, figure out uh, everything they need to know about the pipeline before, before a pipeline breaks so that they can fix it. Actually, I don't think there have there haven't been, to my knowledge, any any breaks in pipelines without there being an external cause, like uh, like the anchor of a ship that has caught the pipeline and damaged it that way, or or, or trawler, or uh, or maybe a nearby large rock has started rolling and rolled onto the pipe and uh, damaged it that way. So it's uh, it's uh, usually external forces that that hurt them. The next one we have on our list is the downhole safety valve. And you can see it is uh, placed here, which is, this is the production line going up here, up to the production wing valve out to the side. So the downhole safety valve is more or less as the surface controlled subsurface safety valve. So it's just a safety valve which is inside the well. We have the injection check valve. Uh, a check valve means that it allows flow from one side to the other, but not back again. So it will completely block a flow coming the other way. And this one is an injection check valve, so it means that it, it will allow injection fluid to be injected into the production uh, pipe, but it will, uh, will not allow a production flow to, to exit that way. Uh, and then we are talking about injection of inhibitors for corrosion and, and uh, hydrates. Here we have an uh, injection manifold isolation valve. This will be, be most of the manifold unit where it's just loads of pipes coming in and they are gathering flows and everything. So <coughs> as we can see from the uh, injection, pipeline that one goes down here over there down there and it actually is directly connected to the injection manifold isolation valve then we have the injection valve itself which is placed by the injection check valve so that is to, to regulate if you are actually going to inject something or not
Then we have the injection manifold crossover valve, uh, which is for the uh, injection manifold here. You have a different valve here, which is a crossover between, we have a pig entry also. Yeah, that's the flow line for the, for the uh, injection stuff. So, so if you're injecting um, a fluid, you know, the fluid of course has to come from somewhere. So you need, you need a separate flow line coming in here. So you have the crossover there, but you also have a pig entry here. So you can send a pig through, through the, uh, the injection line. Basically, so <coughs> you have the lower master valve, which is placed over it there, but it is placed in in the production line there. You have a pig drive valve. Sort of hate the fact that they are jumping all over the place when they are doing this, but they could have gathered them a bit more. So the pig drive valve, it's in connection with running a pigging module through it. We can look at the line here. It's going down here, and it's actually connected to, uh, uh, this is a chemical line, it says. So not quite sure why they have the chem chemical line connected to the, to the pigging uh, valve, but there must be a reason. We have a production isolation valve. We have the production swab valve at the top of the Christmas tree, again for uh, allowing access if we are doing uh, work inside the Christmas tree, inside the production string of the uh, on the Christmas tree. We have a production wing valve out on the side there. We also have a production crossover isolation valve, pigging crossover valve a service isolation valve. I'm guessing this means that when, when, we are uh, when it's needed to do any service, servicing on the, uh, on the system, they can isolate it by shutting off the flow there, the isolation valve. Uh, service manifold isolation valve, which I'm guessing is to, to isolate just this part, the, the manifold part, so then you can just Isolate it from the rest if you need to do some work inside there. You have the service crossover isolation valve over there. And you have the upper master valve. Why they couldn't do that one along with the lower master valve, I don't really know. But um, they had the lower master valve here, and it was shown over here. And then you have the upper one up there. Right. Um, So this one shows a gate valve, figure 516. And it's really difficult to see what's happening here unless you know what you're looking for. This is sort of an excerpt from, from a technical drawing uh, from an assembly, which is uh, something that you're going to make in, in uh, the CAD class uh, as we go along. So you have a parts list over here with item numbers. And then you have these balloons that show the location of each of the item numbers. But what we need to, to uh, mostly focus on here is that this is the, this is the actual valve uh, in it. So you will have the production line going through here, and then you have this one which is closing and opening uh, in order to, to, to either close the, the flow or, or open for it. But the way it's being closed and opened is through this machinery, which is here. And it's a fail-safe valve, which means that if you lose your hydraulic pressure, it's going to close. So that it needs constant uh, hydraulic pressure. So you need to have a hydraulic contact with it with uh, a certain amount of pressure in order to keep it open. And if something should happen, if, if this uh, hydraulic connection is severed in some way or, or your compressor, your, your hydraulic pump stops working for some reason so that you lose pressure, then this one is going to automatically close, which is often the way, uh, way of doing these master valves and stuff because you want them to, if 
things start to fail, you want the flow to stop because then you don't really you have a uh, you have an uh, you have an uncontrolled situation on your hands. Then so so if you can just uh, have an automatic shutdown of of the flow, then that's the best way of doing it because then you don't have to worry about the flow from the well. At least that's uh, that's taken care of, and then you can take care of all of the other problems that you have uh, going on at the moment. So that's uh, these parts here. Those are uh, springs. So they are uh, helical springs, spirals uh, of springs, steel springs, uh, pretty pretty strong. So they can just uh, shove everything here over to close it completely. And then you insert the uh, hydraulic pressure. So when you you uh, flood this one with hydraulic pressure, you open it and then you compress the springs. So what you do is uh, you put the hydraulic pressure in here. So you press it this way, so that you press this one over uh, uh, to that side, which means that there there is an opening somewhere inside here where it lets the flow through. So when it's pushed over, the the flow and the opening inside the valve is uh, aligned with the with the production tubing, so that you get a full flow going through it. You have a lot of pressure going on here. You just push this over. But if you lose the hydraulic pressure, the uh, springs will just snap back into place, and then you have closed the entire entire production of it. So it's a good way of uh, of making sure that you that you uh, you get it closed if you lose control. <coughs> We're going to look at uh, two more uh, versions of these. Um, <coughs> here is one where, where you, you more, more or less see the outside. So here it's just pointed at this being the hydraulic part of it, the hydraulic actuator. Here you have an uh, ROV actuated uh, nut. So this is just the the uh, the nut that keeps the entire uh, uh, failsafe gate, the valve in place, and that has been that has been uh, tightened by an ROV. So the ROV has manually manually placed this valve into here, and then you have the tip of the valve itself. So you will have uh, ceilings uh, seals in here, which keeps it keeps it from uh, springing a leak. And then you have uh, have the the valve itself with the gate moving open and closed. So I think it says here that it's it's an uh, etal seal that they are using here in order to seal uh, seal the production uh, line. So it's uh, I can't really remember what etal uh, stands for, but it, it is a very very good seal. It can it can uh, it can do a lot of pressure, so it can handle a lot of a lot of pressure. Here is another one uh, of a Christmas tree gate valve. Again, a basic principle is the same. You have the hydraulic operator uh, failsafe closed with the springs that are being compressed, which will, as soon as you lose the pressure, they will uh, will uh, extend again. Uh, and here you have the the uh, valve itself, and you have the production flow going through through here. So as soon as you can see this large black part here, as soon as uh, these springs will be released so that they can uh, extend again, they will pull this entire rod, and then this black part will be placed in front of the the production flow so that it won't won't be able for any flow to pass through it. So I think we'll. We'll uh, stop there for today. We'll continue on next week, either on Monday or on Wednesday. Uh, I'll keep you updated because I'll check. I'll try to uh, get it on Wednesday. 